Good afternoon. Welcome to Patel Chapel. I'm sorry it's toasty. Uh, with the permission of the family, I will give your permission after the, after the initial speaker to take off your jacket, uh, if you feel comfortable that way. Welcome to this service in memory and in celebration of the life of Caesar Pelli. On behalf of the family, I welcome you here as Caesar's friends, colleagues, and students we gather still with a deep sense of loss, but also at the beginning of a time when we can share stories and memories of a remarkable life. We gather to welcome each other with the kinship of each of your experiences and memories of Caesar and the acceptance that each of us will feel that loss differently. I know this is an audience of many different religious backgrounds, but will those who wish please join me in prayer. Gather us together this afternoon, a community of celebration and memory that we might share together how one life touched and changed each of our lives. Give us generosity of spirit, light hearts, and gratitude for so many gifts. Amen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Salovey, the 23rd president of Yale. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Pelly family and on behalf of the Yale family, I welcome you to this service for a wonderful architect, a committed New Haven citizen, and a beloved member of the university community. There will be people speaking today who knew Caesar well over many years and who will describe in detail and with passion his work 
and his life. But I want to say a few words about what it means to Yale, to have Caesar on campus and in our home city. Yale is the only university of its kind to have four schools of the arts, and their presence is critical. At Yale, the arts are a fundamental part of life and help shape our identity. The stature of the deans who lead these schools, their standing in the profession, their leadership, what they model to our students, to the Yale community, and to the world more broadly, is of tremendous institutional significance. Caesar honored Yale in many ways, but first as a dean of the School of Architecture. His tenure coincided with a critical moment in his architectural practice, and yet he gave himself wholly to the task. But Caesar's leadership through his deanship were only one of his gifts to Yale. On a little street across from the British Art Center, Caesar, along with Fred Clark and later Raphael, built Pelly Clark Pelly. And in an outwardly unprepossessing edifice, some of the greatest buildings in the world were planned. Wide-eyed students taken for a visit across the street were transported to New York or China or Kuala Lumpur. They viewed the models under construction, amazed that all this could be happening in this small city above architecturally unremarkable Chapel Street stores. Pelly Clark Pelly also built beautiful Yale buildings, including one triumph soon to be dedicated. But perhaps most important to all of Yale and New Haven was not just that Pelly Clark Pelly was here or that his buildings were here, but that Caesar himself was here. No matter how famous, no matter how important he became, no matter how far he traveled, no matter what great buildings he and Pelly Clark Pelly built, no matter what urbane and sophisticated people he knew, Caesar always seemed delighted to have this place as his hometown. He loved New Haven. He loved that travel between the School of Architecture and his firm was seamless, just down the street. He was a New Haven householder with a summer home on the shoreline. He was a community member who could walk the streets and greet people with a memorable smile. He especially loved the faculty. Until he grew older and it was harder for him to hear well, he frequented a club that met in Jonathan Edwards College. Distinguished faculty members came together to discuss history, literature, and science, all of which he was deeply interested in, and all of which captivated his imagination. He truly was a member of the New Haven and Yale families. Caesar's legendary warmth and down-to-earth charm, his laughter, his generosity, and his ability to make everyone in his presence feel better about themselves made him a valued community member. It is wonderful to have brilliant deans and faculty at a university. It is even more remarkable for them to be beloved community citizens as well. With enduring gratitude to the Pelly family, to Raphael and Dennis and their families, to Pelly Clark Pelly, to all who work in the firm in New Haven and in New York, and to all who admired and loved Caesar, I welcome you here to Battelle today. Whether you are on the live stream in Argentina, China, Kuala Lumpur, across the camp campus in Lindsley Chittenden, or in this room itself. We can all draw together as a community of memory and hope in our regard and affection for Caesar. May those memories be blessings.
Thank you, Reverend Oliver. Thank you, President Salovey. And thank you, all of you, for being here today. In the family, Rafael and I called my father Caesar, or by his nickname, Tato. I remember Caesar always there, always happy, always playful. I remember her teaching me to play chess. He taught me to always focus on the king. It was fun to play with him. His advice always seemed very plain, just common sense, not so much a rule as an easy deduction from the facts of the situation. My parents, Diana and Caesar, Diana Balmori, um, were very close. They talked about the world and ideas. They talked about how things look. When I was with them, typically we'd be walking, even in LA where nobody walks, and they would often point out something like, look at that tree against the sky, it's handsome. And then we'd try to say why it looks so good. And that is why I became a vision scientist, to try and answer those questions. Caesar and Diana lived almost their whole lives together. Caesar was born and grew up in Tucuman. We have the governor of Tucuman with us today. Uh, Tucuman is the fifth largest city in Argentina. It was founded in 1565 by the Spanish conquistador Diego de Villarroel. When Caesar was growing up, the main industry was sugar from sugarcane. Everyone got around by tram. We all lived there for a year when I was six, and I remember the treat of chewing a piece of sugarcane. Tucuman is semi-tropical. It can hit 115 degrees. The streets are lined with orange trees, and when they bloom, the whole city has the orange scent. Caesar's maternal grandmother was indigenous of the Diaguita people. I met her when I was six, and she was in her 80s. She had long black hair, and she wrung the neck of my grandfather's rooster in preparation for a feast. She married an Italian immigrant. Caesar's paternal grandparents also came from Italy. The wife followed the husband years later and tracked him down to Tucuman. Caesar's mother, Teresa, grew up very poor but became a teacher and later founded several elementary schools. Caesar's father worked in the city government and later, during the war, manufactured and sold glue, which he called pellicola. In English, that would be pelli glue. He taught me carpentry. Diana's parents were Spanish and English. They fled Spain during the Civil War and they came to Tucumán in 1940 in one of the last boats as World War II began. Caesar's mother, Teresa, and Diana's mother, Dorothy, both taught at the Escuela Sarmiento, an elementary and high school associated with the university. And they quickly became good friends. This was about 1940, when Caesar was 14 and Diana was eight. The families sometimes went on holidays together. The parents decided early that Caesar and Diana were a good match. And indeed, they did eventually marry in 1950. Tucumán had a good university. Caesar and Diana both studied architecture there. Several teachers, including Sacriste, had fled the Spanish Civil War and brought modernism to Tucumán. Caesar told me how excited he was by Mondrian and the clean lines of modernism. He came back home and explained to his parents that all the decorative details in their furniture at home were superfluous, and he convinced his father to cut them off. <laughs> On reflection, 40 years later, he was embarrassed about this. <laughs> Caesar used to play cards with his friends, and he was good at poker. His brother, Victor, said that when Caesar won, he'd share by giving him a present. And he said he still has one of those presents. Uh, Caesar told me that his friends were sure he'd be a professional poker player. They were very surprised when he became an architect. He told me that he never played poker again after leaving Argentina. When Caesar and Diana got married in Tucumán, Caesar had received a fellowship to do a master's at University of Illinois. But they needed money to pay for Diana's ticket. So the day after the wedding, they secretly went to town and sold all the wedding presents. <laughs> they came to Illinois, and I was soon born there. The transition to USA was dramatic. So Tucumán is semi-tropical, and their parents were middle class. At the University of Illinois, the winter was bitter and they were broke. They lived in a one-room Quonset hut that the university offered to international students. 
It was heated by a coal-burning stove. Caesar told me that one day the stove was burning too hot, so he opened it and threw in a pail of water. Oops. <laughs> the water exploded, and he was thrown against the opposite wall, covered with burning embers. Diana took him to emergency, and thanks to a magic cream, he got no scars. They had no money. They told me that it took them 10 years to pay the obstetrician for my easy birth. To eat, they would cut out discount coupons, and thank God, a local grocery accepted coupons without regard to what the item was, so they paid with just coupons, no cash. As a treat, they would go to a local diner and buy a cup of coffee. They became good friends with another couple there, Myrtle and Joe Silva, who became my godparents. For the first Thanksgiving, several families put their money together to buy a turkey, which Diana and Caesar cooked. When everyone sat at the table, they asked where the gravy was. Diana and Caesar asked what that was. They had already discarded all the juice from the pan. Even 50 years later, they were embarrassed because the others were so disappointed. But they had no idea that people saved the juice. Caesar's first job was working with Aero Saarinen in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. All I remember of that time was learning to swim and ride a bike, and my parents showing us how to pour molten lead into water to produce amazing shapes. Years later, I remember our family visiting the TWA terminal at JFK that the Saarinen office designed at that time. It hadn't opened yet, so the runways were not yet in service, so we were allowed to drive on it, on the runway, and we went very fast. The Saarinen office moved here to New Haven, and we moved with it. Sometimes Caesar would bring us to work and give us a table and paper and pencils to draw with. During that time, Dion and Caesar used to read to us after dinner from the Odyssey, one book a night. We all loved it, so we followed with the Iliad, but we all got bored with the order of battle, a very long list of who came from where. Caesar and uh, Raphael and I drew a lot. Sometimes we got clay from a local clay pit and we made sculptures, usually animals. We also made masks from paper mache after seeing some impressive ancient Greek war masks. Then Caesar took a job at Daniel Mann, Johnson, and Mendelhall, Dim Jim, in Los Angeles. He told me that his colleagues told him that this would be a terrible mistake because the contracts the firm worked under were focused on cost, not great architecture. But in fact, he did great architecture on a budget. There's a 12-volume history of the world by Arnold Toynbee. I remember Caesar reading it volume by volume until he reached the end. No matter what time or place, Caesar always seemed to know what had happened there. Caesar and Diana were great parents. When I introduced them to my friends, my friends wanted to be adopted. Caesar was very focused on his work, but it never took over. He was always home for dinner and on weekends, and Raphael and I saw him every day. And he was always fun to be with. Raphael will tell you more soon. I want to thank my cousin Marga and my uncle Victor, Caesar's brother, for help with the history. Thank you. I am Mariana. I am Caesar's tato, niece. And we have a tradition in our family. And it is to, when somebody passes in the family, we sing for them uh, poems of the death of his father by Jorge Manrique, who died in 1479. My grandmother, Dorothy, sang it for my grandfather, for our grandfather. Diana sang it for Dorothy, I for my father and for Diana, and now for Caesar. Recuerde el alma dormida, avive el seso y despierte contemplando. Cómo se pasa la vida, cómo se viene la muerte, tan callando. Cuán presto se va el placer, 
como después de acordado da dolor, como a nuestro parecer cualquiera tiempo pasado fue mejor. Nuestras vidas son los ríos que van a dar en la mar, que es el morir. Allí van los señoríos, derechos hacia acabar y consumir. Allí los ríos caudales, allá los otros medianos y más chicos. Allegados son iguales los que viven de sus manos y los ricos. Este mundo es el camino para el otro que es morada sin pesar. Mas cumple tener buen tino para andar esta jornada sin errar. Partimos cuando nacemos, andamos mientras vivimos y llegamos al tiempo que fenecemos. Así que cuando morimos descansamos Well, good afternoon everybody. I I want to welcome everybody that I consider to be the great Caesar Pelli and associates, Pelli Clark, Pelli family. Um, you know, I'm tempted to do something if you don't mind. Just, it'll just take a minute. Anyone who's ever worked for us in the past, present, or works for us in, uh, in currently, would you just mind standing for just a second so we can see who all is here? <laughs> um, a huge extended family uh, emanating from Caesar and Diana and the family, trem it's tremendous heritage. Uh, we did a calculation uh, on Friday just to see how many people we've employed over 42 years and it's 1,197 jobs, you can think of it that way, over the years, which I'm extremely proud of. Um, but you can call me employee number one if you want to. Um, <laughs> Um, as some of you know, I met Caesar when I was still an undergraduate at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I was still a year away from graduating. Uh, he came to school to give lectures, to uh, participate in juries. Uh, he saw some of my work, but honestly, I don't remember him seeing very much of my work. Uh, what I do remember is at a faculty party after that wonderful day of juries, I walked across the lawn, and in these days, this was Austin before it became discovered and sophisticated and expensive. Um, this beautiful faculty lawn, uh, the crickets were chirping, it was a beautiful balmy evening, and this, these gales of laughter were just rolling across the grass. Uh, and you can't help but be attracted to gales of laughter. So I wandered over to the origin of, of this wonderful sound, uh, and it was Diana. Uh, Diana was just, she was just having such an incredibly good time, and so was Caesar. Uh, and this beautiful, beautiful couple, I'll never forget the, the look of just, just the way they presented themselves. We talked about absolutely everything, we talked about everything but architecture. Uh, they were interested in everything, they were interested in music, photography, art. Uh, we talked mostly probably about the Beatles. Uh, and then the evening was over, and I went back to school to finish my, to finish my work for that semester. Uh, and then, almost exactly a month later, I got this. A letter from Caesar, dated May 16, 1969. Ugh. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because I won't be able to get through it, as, as you can tell. 
Uh, but I was so thrilled with this letter, and it was just so unusual. Uh, I, I'm still reading it, still trying to believe that it's real, even today. Um, I showed it to my father, and I said, Dad, what should I do about this? And he said, well, obviously, you have to call him uh, and see what the terms of, of your working for him are. And my father, who was an extremely practically minded person, said, and you have to ask three questions, and you have to do it in exactly this order. Uh, and the answer to each question gives you a sense of what the answer to the next question might be. The three questions are, number one, what will you be doing when you work for him? Uh, he said, you have to be certain that you have some value, that you have something to do, because without value, the other two questions won't matter at all. Um, and he said, the second question is really easy. What's it going to cost to live in Los Angeles? You know, mind you, I'd been living in Austin, Texas in the 60s, uh, which was about the least expensive place that one could possibly imagine living. Uh, and he said, it's really important that you know what you're getting yourself into. Ask him how much it's going to cost to live there. And he said, and finally, sort of depending on what those other two uh, answers are, ask him how much you're going to make. So I called Caesar, uh, and I got my first introduction to one of his just gigantic laughs. Oh, Fred, and he just rolled with laughter. Good to hear you. Great to hear from you. I never thought I'd hear from you. Um, he said, and I said, Caesar, may I ask you a few questions? And he said, sure, why not? I mean, that's one of Caesar's patented phrases is, sure, why not? Um, and I said, well, I, I have three questions for you. I, I'm not going to make this quick. I said, first of all, what will I be doing when I move to Los Angeles to work for you? He let out another hoot of laughter. He said, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> he said, just come. We'll find something for you to do. I promise you, don't worry about it. You'll have a job. Um, so I, on, the, on the back of the same piece of paper, I'm kind of keeping score, and I, I write, look, answer to the first question, undetermined, possibly zero. <laughs> the next question was, what's the cost of living in 1969 in Los Angeles? Another peal of laughter, and he said, oh gosh, he said, probably today for you it would be $70 a week. Um, and I thought, well, okay, $70 a week times roughly four weeks a month. That's $280. I said, OK, now at least I know what my month is going to cost. And I finally, I said, OK, so what do you uh, imagine I will be being paid? And I was being as indirect and polite as I possibly could in asking these tough questions. And he said, oh, I really don't know quite yet. How about $4 an hour? So a little bit more mental math. And I realized that $4 an hour is roughly $680, $690 a month. Uh, I've subtracted my cost of living from that. Uh, it looked like I was going to net, at least on this piece of paper, $300 a month. And I thought, well, gee, that's a lot of money. You know, I can, I can survive pretty nicely on $300 a month. So I said, I will be there. When do you want me there? And he said, how about, how about um, June 9th, which was the subject of this next card? So I showed up on June 9th. Uh, indeed, they put me to work immediately. It was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful summer. This was just a summer job. I worked with Arthur Golding, who's in the audience today, some of the brightest and most interesting young designers, I think, uh, in the profession at that time. It was a very small design department. We did absolutely everything together. Uh, collaboration was the, was the way that we, that we socialized and the way that we worked. Uh, I was so gung-ho that I actually volunteered to do things that I wasn't even asked to do. Uh, I made a point of introducing myself to all of the partners. Mind you, this is a summer job. Uh, I said, I, I, just in, I just need for you guys to remember who I am. Uh, I introduced myself to all the department heads, the project managers, and mind you, in those days, that the project managers that grew in, they didn't really like architects at all. Uh, and so here was this young upstart introducing himself, forcing himself into their lives. Uh, the summer was over. I went to... Uh, say goodbye to Caesar and to see if I had a job in the future. And he said, he sat me down and he said, well, you know, Fred, he said, you've done very, very well. And we've noticed the energy and the enthusiasm. Uh, he said, even the, even the project managers seem to like you, which is really unusual because they don't even really like me that much. Uh, and he said, so we welcome you back. 
And he said, and you've really, really contributed. But then he said, and I'll always remember this, he said, you've really contributed, not so much in the way of ideas, but you've really contributed in the way of energy. And I thought to myself, you know, for $4 an hour, I'm not going to contribute ideas. <laughs> you know, I ideas are $6 an hour, and, and good ideas are $8 an hour. So uh, I knew where I would start in terms of my salary when I came back to, to work with him then. And we worked together in L.A. for seven years uh, until moving to New Haven. Just one more very funny story that's also very typical of Caesar. Now let's fast forward 20 years and let's go to Tokyo, Japan. Um, Caesar and I are there together. Our partner in Japan, Jun Mitsui, uh, is also here in the room today. Uh, we finished a long, long day of meetings, uh, very successful meetings. Then we, we are invited to a wonderful uh, kaiseke meal that evening long evening, and I think Caesar I was going to probably be tired and ready to go to the hotel by then, uh, but then one of the young designers says, how about karaoke? Okay, and I have never seen Caesar in a karaoke bar in my whole life until that one evening, and, he, and of course he said it in his patented way, sure, why not? And then all of a sudden his energy level just, just escalated. We went to the karaoke bar, if you've ever been to karaoke, you know the first thing that happens is that you're given this giant catalog of song titles that you sift through and choose the title you want. He jerked it out of my hand. I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to have to sing in Spanish or something. This is, this is going to be a disaster. He, he thumped through it, and one of our, our hosts said, that's the one. That's the one you should do right there. And I looked at it, and I said, oh my gosh, we can't possibly do that song. That's the hardest karaoke song in the book. Nobody can sing that song. And I said, I don't think it's, I think it's going to be a failure. Uh, and he said, but we have to do it because our guests are insisting that we sing this exact song. And I said, it's, I said, Caesar, it's super hard. Let's try to do something else. I said, you like the Beatles. Let's do Rocky Raccoon. Uh, and he said, you know, I sing Rocky Raccoon all the time. I'm, I'm, kind, of ti I'm kind of tired of that song and, and the lyrics are silly anyway. He said, we're going to do what these guys tell us to do. So, the two of us walk up to the stage, two, two guys, it's, you know, you're bathed in the lavender light of, of a karaoke bar. Uh, it's surreal in and of itself. You've got two guys with, a, let's say, ch charitably, in my, in, my, uh, in my view, of at least an eight-inch height difference. Microphones in our hands. I'm thinking to myself, this is a lot like Waiting Godot the musical. You know, this is, this is going to be really stupid. Um, so we get up, and then our host hits the karaoke button, and this is what it sounds like. And I just start collapsing. And I say, Caesar, you know, he said, he said, I got a deal for you. You sing the verses, and I'll sing the chorus, okay? Now, if anybody knows that song, Don't Stop Believing, uh, it's all verses. There's, a, <laughs> there's only one chorus, and the chorus is at the very, very end. And I don't know if he knew that or not. But so I'm, I'm, the music starts, I'm singing, and I'll tell you what, I just, I own this song. <laughs> I own this song. I do such a good job, I impress even myself. Now, a good karaoke machine will make anybody sound like a good singer. But that night, I was really on fire. So I was, I was working it. I was going through the verses. I went through verse number three. The chorus is coming up. I look there. The chorus is about to appear. Uh, and I look to my left to say, OK, Caesar, it's about time for the chorus. And there was no Caesar. <laughs> and I looked around behind me. And there was Caesar at the table drinking another glass of sake th during this kind of <laughs> doing this wave that those of us who know him so well know he did really. He just said, great, marvelous, fantastic. And, and I said, but you're supposed to do the chorus. And he said, no, 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 no. That song was way, way, way too hard. <laughs> and then he said, we should have done Rocky Raccoon. <laughs> um, so that was, the, that was our karaoke experience. And I think some of you have witnessed that yourselves. What, what I will say, though, is I visited with him last May uh, on the anniversary of this letter. 
the 50th anniversary of this letter. Uh, and I sat with him to thank him for everything that he had done for me. I showed him this letter. He let uh, one very last voluminous laugh. And he said, hey, I've, I don't know quite how to take this. He said, oh, did I write that letter? And I said, well, gee, I, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I didn't, I don't know. I, don't know. I didn't write this letter. Uh, he said, oh, my gosh. He said, Fred, 50 years, my gosh, where did it go? And I said, I have absolutely no idea, but it's the best 50 years anyone could have ever spent in his life. And I thank you very much, my friend. Gentle, graceful, elegant. These words define Caesar Pelli's aesthetic as an architect and his manner as a person. Although Caesar lived a mere 200 yards from our house in New Haven, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting him until 1993, when the remodeled and expanded headquarters of the Yale University Press were dedicated. At the time, Neither of us had any premonition of the important role that Caesar would play in rebuilding the Yale campus over the quarter century that followed. He designed the graceful Landman Center addition to the Payne Whitney Gymnasium, the jewel-like Malone Engineering Center, the splendid Thomas Golden Center at, at St. Thomas More, and the magnificent new Yale Science Building. Caesar and Fred Clark also designed the elegant Yale NUS College campus in Singapore. You might be surprised that I would use the word graceful to describe a large addition to the massive Payne Whitney Gymnasium, housing four basketball courts and an, elegant, and an elevated running track. But graceful it is, because Caesar had the ingenious idea of putting half of the height of the building below ground, stepping down to a friendly engagement with Lake Place and providing abundant above ground fenestration to illuminate the interior and lighten the exterior. And perhaps the word elegant seems an odd word choice for a Yale NUS college that houses 1,000 students in residential colleges, provides offices for 250 faculty and staff, and boasts a library, a student center, a performing arts center, a gym, a dance studio, science labs, 40 classrooms, and abundant green space, all on a 10-acre site. But elegant it is, because Caesar saw almost instantly that he could maintain the look and feel of Yale residential colleges by constructing quadrangles of graceful low-rise buildings around green courtyards and uh, with a clever local adaptation. The classrooms and faculty offices are located in the low-rise buildings while <coughs> the, uh, within the colleges while students are housed in high-rise towers at the corners of the quadrangles. Lush, tropical, and gleaming white, the college is at once Singaporean, and unmistakably Yale. It was a privilege to work with Caesar and his colleagues on these projects over the years, but his contribution to Yale went far beyond his own designs. A few years after I became president, we asked Caesar, Tom Beebe, and Bob Stern to serve as a design review committee to offer advice on all of our major projects as well as on our ongoing master planning. Caesar loved these meetings, I, in part, I think, because he so loved the Yale campus. Its rich mix of architectural traditions, the interplay among its buildings, and its urban setting. We think of Caesar as a modernist, but in the context of renovating the Yale campus, he had exquisite sensitivity in distinguishing which buildings required reverent restoration and which called out for 
intervention and innovation. Caesar also understood which new buildings or additions needed to be understated and deferential to adjacent masterpieces and which could be bold, dramatic, and original. Some architects dreaded the prospect of subjecting their work to reviews by three deans of the Yale Architecture School. But Caesar's comments, even if radically critical in substance, were offered so gently, so respectfully, that they were often embraced without resistance. And it seemed to me there was a common thread in many of Caesar's comments. Lighten it up, it's too heavy. Make it more graceful, more elegant. Drive by Caesar's new Yale Science Building on Whitney Avenue and you will see what I mean. It's a huge building, but set against Philip Johnson's massive monuments, it seems to float on air. Very few of the 40 buildings built over my 20 years as president rise to this level, but dozens of Yale buildings, new and renovated, bear the mark of Caesar's gentle, graceful, and elegant advice. For me, working with Caesar was a joy. His eye was unerring and his taste exquisite. He was a superb listener, attentive and sympathetic. Even his laughter was generous. His characteristic ho-ho might be bemused, but never mocking. His buildings, the fruits of his genius, are gifts to cities and campuses around the world. How fortunate are we, citizens of Yale and New Haven, that he was ours. Honored to be here today, and you know, I have to say, when I look out in the audience, I feel like we were all kids together. We all grew up in that office. We all learned so much in our early formative years, and so I was really honored when Raphael asked me to speak today and to reflect on my memories of this remarkable and generous man. In the last 40 years, I knew Caesar as a Yale dean, a teacher, an employer, a mentor, a humanist, oh, always a humanist, a father figure, and a friend. 18 of those years I spent in this firm, and the last 22 of them, I've been working on my own firm with my partner, Jeff Payne. At each phase of my career, Caesar's words of wisdom have resonated for me and brought me insight. His wisdom is always present. When Raphael asked me to speak from personal experience, it occurred to me to read a letter that I had written to Caesar a few years back. And I used to do this periodically. I didn't get a letter from him, but I kept sending him letters. Um, and I, I tried to share with him what was in my heart and what I learned from him. Dear Caesar, if we are really fortunate in life, we are blessed to have encountered great teachers, mentors, and fantastic leaders. Caesar, you are all of these. It began in our formative years when you taught us the value of your Socratic design process as you led us through inquiry. You taught us that we should be judged by the quality of the questions that we asked. And oftentimes with each of those hundreds of design models that we all built, and we all thinking to ourselves the night before you're gonna to present to Caesar, you're thinking, is this the right solution? And I still remember Caesar would look at your model and he would look at you and he would go, that is a very good question. 
And the questions were valuable because that question led to the next question, which led to the right answer. I love the story with you as my mentor, the story that you told about Eros Saarinen as your mentor. When he came to the studio with a drawing in his hand of a design he had been working on and asked the design team what they thought. When everyone around the table, who was a little intimidated, they were completely silent, Eero simply crumpled up the drawing and told the team, start anew. How liberating. You too would come to a design problem with no preconceived ideas. It opened the door for all of us to participate in the search for the right solution. How empowering is that? As we matured and learned about your world of ideas, we learned that it was not enough to have solved the architectural problem. I remember presenting a scheme for one of your projects to you with utmost clarity and logic. And you said, well, it all looks very logical and it all works, but is it beautiful and how will it be experienced? That was a great reminder that in the end, the architecture must stand on its own with no explanation other than what it can contribute to society. It was also a moment that I realized that your architecture was shaped by a set of values and not theories. Guiding principles, as you called them, that had been acquired through years of experience. It was these guiding principles that allowed us to grow our wings within your firm and build our own sense of confidence as a diverse set of designers. It was after I left you and built my own firm with Jeff that you shared perhaps your greatest advice. You asked if I was teaching. You said, it's vitally important to surround yourself with talented, intelligent young people, for they will keep you fresh and give your work longevity. Caesar, I still carry with me the many lessons I learned while working with you. The respect you have earned and the respect you have given to others continues to be attributes that I strive for every day. With you as my model, your wisdom will always follow me in my work and my practice. Warmest regards, Tehran. I should also add, and I appreciate um, there's going to be lots of references to Caesar's laughter. And his laughter to me was his way of opening up his soul to other people. And he had a wicked sense of humor. I remember one time I had this conversation with him and I said, Caesar, I have to tell you, there used to be this old show called Kung Fu. And on that show, there was a young guy who had you know, grown up and he always remembered what the great master told him. And the young grasshopper would go to the master and ask him important questions. And you remind me of that every time I think of you, Caesar. And he said, that's wonderful, Turan. Just don't shave your head. <laughs> so Caesar, you'll be missed, but you'll never be forgotten because you're such a sweet, sweet, and inspiring man. Eleventh Elegy, Beginning the Spring Chores by Nikita Stanescu. I shall run everywhere at once. After my own heart, I shall run, like a chariot in battle pulled everywhere at once by a herd of galloping horses. I shall run until the forward rush, the rush it itself will surpass me and leave me far behind, like fruit peel from seed, till running itself starts running and stops. I'll then collapse like a young man greeting his lover. 
Here I am, remaining what I am, under flags of solitude, under shields of cold, running back towards myself, tearing me from everywhere, tearing me from forward, tearing me from behind, from the right and from my left, from above and beneath me, living from everywhere and gifting everywhere roots to memory, stars for the skies, air for earth, green-leafed branches for the shadows. Goodbye, Caesar.
As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lystragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lystragonians, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when, with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you're seeing for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for, but don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you'll have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. It's an honor to be with you all today to remember and celebrate Caesar Pelli. I will be talking about the school, the students, and the faculty on whom Caesar had tremendous and meaningful impact. It is a slightly different part of Caesar's life than Fred and Rick and Tehran spoke about, but it's inevitable that I'll also mention, as they did, his elegance and grace, his talent and intelligence, his generosity and kindness, and his laugh, which I can't begin to imitate. Caesar was a gifted architect and a thoughtful one, but I knew him as an architectural educator, and that was something he did exceptionally well. In preparing for these remarks in my office, which was once his office at Yale, I found an old photograph of Caesar, probably taken around 40 years ago. He is sitting on a review, a classic School of Architecture event, and it reminded me of how I remembered Caesar when I was junior faculty. He was no longer dean, but very present at the school. He was serious and engaged, smiling warmly, but intensely focused on the design in front of him. It documented what I had witnessed and also what so many alumni told me in the days after his death. To a one, they said, Caesar cared about me and my work. You can see that care in this photograph. He is happy to be surrounded by students and designers, people working on something he cared passionately about, architecture. That care continued for all of them who stayed in touch, and they mentioned that as well. Some went to work for Pelly Clark Pelly, a thousand <laughs> more. Uh, some went to work uh, in Chicago or LA. Others moved halfway around the world. But if they saw Caesar or contacted him, he remembered them, their work, their designs, and their lives. They were part of an extended family of Yale-trained architects, and he had nurtured them all. That affection and support extended to faculty as well and went beyond architecture to life. And for you non-architects in the room, this is actually exceptional that an architect care about life beyond just designing buildings. In my life, it included his critical yet supportive comments on my first buildings, and I believe the phrase he used to describe them was they were citrus tart. Wasn't sure if that was a compliment or not. Um, 
He was also interested in my family, and when I got married, Caesar and Diana sent two small, elegant, modern, blown glass pitchers, the kind you'd put on the table if you were serving breakfast, maybe to Jackie Kennedy, or to Caesar Pelli, for that matter. Um, we still have them, and when asked, where did you get those beautiful things, I say with pride, they were a wedding present from Caesar Pelli and Diana Balmori. As with other faculty members, Caesar would occasionally invite me to lunch at his office, go up the steep stairs, to see what he was curious about that day. He was curious and interested in what the students were doing, and most especially what they were interested in. And when I became dean, those lunches became more frequent. How Caesar is it that four deans and 35 years later, he was still so passionate and interested in the school? Caesar's warmth and generosity and his unforgettable laugh have been mentioned, as I said. I'm delighted to be the one to note that Caesar was also chic, and perhaps all the more chic because he didn't really focus at all on being chic. What was practical, elegant, and understated for Caesar was the definition of personal chicness itself to me as an observer. He had a style that went from the scale of inches, v-neck sweaters beneath a tweed jacket, the oversized eyeglasses, and his white brawn watch, all the way to the skyline shaping profile of the twin Protonus towers at more than 1,400 feet. Now that's a tall expanse of chic. He was chic and he was brilliantly talented, but it was his vision and his engagement, his defense of the strength and value of the place that had the greatest impact on the school. Caesar was supportive of young architects and of women having careers in traditionally male-dominated fields like architecture. And I'm sure I'm not the only one here who got both a wedding present and helpful advice on how to get the next big commission. Raphael and Dennis and everyone in the Pelly family, Fred, Susanna, and everyone at Pelly Clark Pelly, Caesar's work family, on behalf of the School of Architecture, Caesar's extended family at the corner of York and Chapel, how blessed are we all to have had Caesar in our lives. His gifted hand and design vision were valuable. Having his wise counsel to help shape a global practice or direct a school of architecture with a global reputation, that feels irreplaceable. He was a good man, a generous soul, and a spirited sage. Godspeed, dear Caesar. Brilliant architect, inspired educator, superb dean, and true friend. My deepest condolences to Raphael and Dennis. Um, this is a special time in my life. I'm proud to be here today. Um, I'd like to express a few ideas that I thought about related to your dad that I think you'll enjoy. Caesar and I first met in 1993 when I was on a panel to interview the three architects Owens Corning had shortlisted to design the new world headquarters that was planned for Toledo, Ohio. Caesar was like a breath of fresh air. You could see how much he loved and enjoyed his work. Visiting his firm on numerous trips to work on projects, Marilyn and I would come loaded down with sketches and glass studies, carrying up the steep stairs to his office where he would help us unwrap them, excitedly calling in others to view. Caesar loved materials and shared his delight and enthusiasm. I remember early on bringing an electroluminescent encapsulated art glass panel for a lighting application we were working on. When I asked him what he wanted to see if it worked, he said, sure. So imagine this panel with this gadget in it with these wires that I had sticking out the end. And Caesar said, yeah, let's try it. So we went out of the conference room, we went to another room, and we found some outlets along the floor. I know Tehran and Mr. Shoemaker was there. And so I plug it into those two little openings in the socket, and it, st it started to light up. It was glowing. Then it started to spark, and then smoke came out. <laughs> and then <laughs> everybody got up. I look around, and Caesar had been looking right over the project. I look back, and Caesar's totally at the opposite end of the room. And he said, and uh, 
this should be, I memorialize this thing. He said, great, Tom, great, but wow. <laughs> For me, it was always that he couldn't get enough of my artwork in the building, and he kept coming up with ideas that we could try. In hindsight, it was true collaboration. Caesar knew what he knew, and he knew what I didn't know. He said that collaboration forces you to stretch yourself. He was bold when I hesitated about my work dominating the space. He said that he would never compromise the integrity of the project and that my art would make it more meaningful experience for the people using the building. I used to think of our friendship centered on art and architecture, but in many of the letters to us, I am reminded when he spoke about one winters in New Haven. I have similar feelings about the snow, he wrote. It is irritating when I shovel it, when my car gets stuck, when my feet get wet, but I love what it does to the garden and to all the landscape. It is one of the reasons that I prefer the changing New England weather to reliable sunny California. And he wrote about the time away from New Haven. Last week, Diana and I took a short holiday in London. We went to every exhibition and play we could get in and came back replenished. During the summer, Marilyn and I had a, a vegetable garden, and we would bring things from our garden and were visiting his studio. But it was the garlic we grew that reminded him of his childhood in Argentina. He said, your garlic smells like roses to me, Tom. It shall be thoroughly enjoyed very fast, unfortunately. I hate to say it, but only the gar only garlic I get is the ordinary one from the market, nothing like yours. I don't believe there is any garlic as tasty as the one you have been so kind to give me for so many years. I can still see him standing at the top of the stairs as we left. Don't forget the garlic. His letters would end. I am very well and very busy, and those two things seem go together. I hope you two are also busy and well. That was Caesar, a man who appreciated and loved many things with a passion for life, family, friends, and his work a passion that he shared. He will be missed. Thank you. It is so nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience, and it makes me feel that we are truly a unique family. It's also very nice to see so many representatives of the Argentine community, and we are really very honored to have you here. Caesar would say that Argentina was a big part of who he was. And I would like to take a moment to explain what Caesar meant to Argentina by telling a short story. So two years ago, Argentina presented a bid to host the 2023 International Expo in Buenos Aires. With a video highlighting the best that Argentina had to offer to the world. The video displayed the natural splendor of Patagonia, the art of the asados, and the poesy of the tango. The attention then was turned to the people that make Argentina so special, highlighting to the world the, um, the magnificence of Messi and the holiness of the Pope. And then it showed Caesar with the skyline of Buenos Aires and the four handsome buildings that are now part of his legacy. Although Messi and the Pope are very popular, they can also generate very divided opinions. But when it comes to Caesar, everyone agreed that he was the best. Beyond his buildings, Argentines really learned to admire that he never changed his down-to-earth attitude or his gratitude to the school of Tucumán who formed me. I started to work in this office 27 years ago, and two months later, 
Caesar was commissioned to design his first building in Argentina. So I had the unique chance to travel with him from very early on. Traveling with Caesar to Argentina was always a pleasure, but it was seldom an easy task. I very soon learned that part of my job was to protect Caesar from the reporters and the frenzy crowds waiting for him after each and every one of the many lectures that he offered there. In this effort, my best ally was Carlos, Caesar's younger brother. With his exceptional humility and sense of humor, Caesar would turn to us and joke that he had no idea that he was signing for that when he chose to become an architect. Caesar was very humble, but there were two things that he liked to brag about with me. The first one was Spanish. He was totally convinced that his Spanish was better than mine. <laughs> we will settle our differences by checking constantly his Spanish dictionary. And we must have been both very stubborn because it took us several years to admit that neither of us spoke proper Spanish. <laughs> he spoke Tucumano and I spoke Porteño. Secondly, there was tango. Um, Caesar and I could not sing, but we both liked to recite tango. We never settled who was better at that, but I should have told him that I really admire that he could be so good at reciting tango when actually looking at the past with nostalgia was not his style. He will always remember his childhood and youth in Tucumán with pure joy and even a sense of wonder on how his life had turned out to be. As a teacher, Caesar extended his hand to many architectural schools in Argentina, establishing internship programs with several of them. In the history of our office, we had about 30 Argentine employees, and there are currently six of us. But regardless of nationality or any other label, Caesar embraced everyone in his studio as part of his extended family. He valued all of us as individuals, and he made the time to get to know our spouses, significant others, and our children. When I was working on Caesar's second building in Argentina, I became a mother of twins. And I found really hard to juggle architecture and motherhood. I told Caesar that I had painfully decided to give up on architecture. But he was really determined to make things work for me even offering to babysit my kids. <laughs> Though he never got to do that, I'm here today mainly because of his relentless support. Caesar, um, Caesar had a tradition of making these beautiful pastel sketches for, um, for clients um, as a way of um, showing his appreciation um, for their help to get these buildings built. And so when we were designing our third tower in Buenos Aires, Caesar did one of these beautiful sketches. And as I was still working a few days a week from home, he sent the pastel home with my husband who also works with us. And so we were looking together at the pastel um, when one of our kids walks into the room and he points out very disappointedly that the tower uh, was incomplete. And the truth was that uh, Caesar had left out two narrow strips to the side of our tower that in my son's uh, mind, it made the tower look like a rocket uh, ready to uh, take off. So I told Caesar the story and we both laughed 
Um, but a few days later, uh, he calls me into his office and I found him standing up, pointing out to a new pastel on his wall um, with a big smile on his face. He says, Susana, you can tell Mikel that his tower is ready to take off once again. He had redone the sketch, taking the advice of a five-year-old boy, um, and then he unpinned the pastel and gave it to me to bring home. On talking to people in our studio, I know there are two things about Cesar that we all miss the most, his mentorship and his laughter. When we finished our fourth building in Argentina, the first building changed ownership and suffered some alterations. In my mind, the result was not very flattering, and so I walked into Caesar's office to break the bad news to him. And Caesar listened to me very attentively, and then he said, well, Susana, I see that we have two options here. We can cry or we can laugh. And then laughing loudly as only he could, he said, I choose to laugh as I needed some explanation. <laughs> um, and then he continued, uh, Susana, our buildings are like our children. We have to love them all the same. We help them grow but they really do not belong to us. And we have to learn to let them go. As hard as it is, I know today is my turn to learn to let you go. Adios, mi querido Cesar.
adiós muchachos, compañeros de mi vida, barra querida de aquellos tiempos, me toca a mí hoy emprender la retirada, debo alejarme de mi buena muchachada. Adiós muchacho, ya me voy y me resigno contra el destino. Nadie la calla, se terminaron para mí todas las farras. Mi tiempo es fermo, no resiste más. Acuden a mi mente recuerdos de otros tiempos, de los buenos momentos que antaño disfruté. Cerquita de mi madre, santa viejecita, y de mi noviecita que tanto idolatré. Dos lágrimas sinceras derramo en mi partida por la barra querida que nunca me olvidó. Y, le, y al dar a mis amigos mi adiós postrero, les doy con toda mi alma mi bendición. Adiós muchachos, compañeros de mi vida, barra querida de aquellos tiempos. Me toca a mí hoy emprender la retirada, debo alejarme de mi buena muchachada. Adiós muchachos, ya me voy y me resigno contra el destino. Nadie la calla. Se terminaron para mí todas las farras, mi cuerpo enfermo no resiste más. Gracias Mariana, Daniel, gracias Ezequiel, qué lindo. Somewhere Caesar was singing along to the tango, he loved the tangos. As I was trying to remember my father and put my thoughts together, I was helped by many of you and the hundreds and hundreds of notes and cards and phone calls and emails you all sent me with condolences, sympathies, but a lot of lovely anecdotes and, and stories. And there were certain words that were repeated again and again, gracious, distinguished, kind. And he was all those things and he was many more. He was an adventurer, and he lived an adventurous life, and you heard some of that from Dennis, from my brother, is growing up in Tucumán, coming to the Midwest for 10 years, then going to New Haven, then Los Angeles, and back to Yale. And as a true adventurer, much as the poem that Kate read about Ithaca, he enjoyed the journey and enjoyed every stop and he took, savored the best of every stop along the way. He wrote a beautiful autobiography and a series of essays to my two daughters, very personal. And one of the things he wrote in it was, I was unquestionably lucky. I took several leaps into the unknown. He wasn't always lucky. Dennis told you the story of how they sold their wedding presents in order for them both to come to America. There's a, there's a follow-on to that story, which is it still wasn't enough money. So they went to the local casino, half an hour outside of Tucumán, and tried to find the best odds they could give, the closest odds they could get to have 50-50 chance, which obviously still wasn't quite that. And they put all the money down that they were either both going to go or neither was going to go. And they lost. 
Hoping for that miracle, they still lost. They decided that Caesar should still go, and he did. And several weeks later, Diana's aunt in Mexico City heard the story and sent enough money down so she could come join him, which was a good thing because she then announced she was pregnant. So they were starting a life in many ways, <laughs> starting a new life in, in, in America. He always marveled at where his adventures took him. Going to University of Illinois from northern Argentina, is not knowing anybody as a stranger, he marveled at the openness and the generosity and how one thing led to another. And the dean of the architecture school had a friend, John Dinklu, who recommended him for a job. And he came in and worked for Saren. And there he was. A few short years after coming to this country with nothing, knowing no one, there he was working on the TWA terminal at this incredible practice for a Finnish-American architect with the brilliant second-in-charge Irishman, Kevin Roach. And he became part of this community and just opened up this world to him that he never imagined, didn't even know existed when he first came to this country. The other big adventure was when he left Los Angeles. He, he decided he wanted to be on the East Coast. Diana had had to move to the East Coast to teach. And so he decided to become an academic. He took the deanship at Yale, thinking, well, okay, I'm, now I'm going to be a teacher for the rest of my life, and, and I'm happy to do it. I'll have a small practice on the side. Months after coming, he got a major commission, then another and another, and he ended up with this practice that he never imagined or predicted. But Somehow, the fates were lucky to him in, in the larger cosmic sense, even if he had moments along the way. Beyond being an adventurer, he was a nurturing, fun father, as Dennis already alluded to, always present, uh, very challenging. As all of you know who've spent time with him, he'll, he'll challenge your ideas and why you're doing what you're doing, but, but never dictating. One of my favorite memories of him was, was the reading. We read a lot in our family. We read a lot together in our family. But at a moment in his career when he was working a lot, traveling a lot, he would still be home every night to read to us. Now, we were not small children. I was probably 11 and Dennis was 14. We were in separate bedrooms, which were diagonally across one another. And he would perch his chair between us, lots of arguments about whether he's closer to Dennis or me. And he would read to us including at one point he decided to read The Lord of the Rings. God knows how many months that took. <laughs> but we were riveted and we were waiting every night to find out what happens next. And those images from that time still remember are very strong for me. He was an adoring, adoring grandfather. He saved in these last few years his biggest smiles and his biggest praise for, for Delia and Iris. He was also quite silly, which many of you may not have had a chance to see that side of him. He loved bad jokes, bad puns in particular. He loved wordplay. He loved to sing, but the singing, he would be the first to tell you he couldn't carry a tune. It had very little to do with the melody. He loved the lyrics, and he loved reciting the lyrics. And primarily, primarily he gravitates either towards silly lyrics or towards wildly dramatic lyrics, hence the tango. He loved the tangos because there's nothing more dramatic than tango. And he would recite the stories of love and loss that, that, you, would have, that you would always hear in the tango. But as I think of all the qualities, the two to me that most defined him were a combination of qualities that often came together. There was a, a firmness to his ideas. There was always logic and purpose to his decisions. And that was coupled with a generosity of spirit. Everyone mattered. He had time for anyone. His highest praise was that was a bit of clear thinking, or somebody was a clear thinker. That was about the most complimentary thing he could say about someone. He wrote of himself, I was always good at making decisions, hard but quick ones. And those qualities together allowed him to be himself with anyone, with presidents of universities, presidents of countries, CEOs, 
students and kids. He always made time for kids when they came by. Even in the middle of, work, of a work day, he'd always make time for kids. An old friend of my father's who spent many years working with them and they maintained a close friendship even the years, the later years, Carol Ann Morrissey, who's here with us, had a great line about him, which I'm, I'm stealing from her, I'm borrowing with her permission, that he was an extraordinary, ordinary man. And I thought, now yes, and that's, it captures so much about him. He would grill me about my summer plans during college. And if I, one year I proposed going on a summer travel program, and he gave me kind of a, a scant look, let's call it, and proceeded to ask, well, why? And what do you think you're going to get out of that? And how is this benefiting you? And we spent quite a couple of days talking about why and whether I should do it. But then in the end, he, he agreed. But then, it, conversely, in 1976, he came to me and he asked my permission to come to Yale. I had come here as a student. I was very happily 3,000 miles away from home. <laughs> the kid from California, which is still kind of cool then, at the Yale campus. And he knew I was happy to be independent, so he, he didn't want to presume. So he came and he asked me if it would be all right if he accepted the deanship to come to Yale and be head of the architecture school. But he'd, he'd leave me alone. I took that to be a rhetorical question. <laughs> But it was very sweet of him to ask. He would read Scientific American religiously back in the days, cover to cover. Then he'd put aside that aside and read the Sunday comics. Y siempre, siempre los libros de Mafalda que le encantaba. When a year ago, my brother and I were sitting with him, and we asked him, "What would you like for your memorial?" And he looked at us with a big grin and he says, I don't care, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> this is for you, do what you want. <laughs> it was all clear and generous at the same time. And then of course he laughed and laughed. And so many of you mentioned that today and I have to say in the many hundreds of notes and letters I got, if there was one word that was the most commonly used word, it was laughter. So I know, usually we're being discreet around me, so it wasn't around me so much, but I know all of you who worked in the office particularly would have your own imitation of Caesar's laugh. <laughs> and you would have contests to have Caesar's laugh. So I can't think of a nicer way to remember and honor him on the count of three, and I'm not gonna do it because I can't imitate his laugh at all, but all of you together on the count of three to remember Caesar. One, two, three. <laughs> He would have loved that. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you, Tato, for living so well and for showing us how to live well. We love you. Following a brief blessing, you're invited to a reception, which will be at the Yale Art Gallery. I have special instructions for all of you, which is that you are to exit from this door onto Old Campus, and on your way, you are to pick up a flower. You are to carry it out the High Street gate, down High Street, turn right on Chapel, 
and there is a flower wall there where you'll be, you'll be asked to place the flower before you go into the reception. We've been here together for a brief time and have shared stories and laughter and perhaps a few tears. So now we ask to be sent out in peace to take this gracious, creative man's spirit with us into our own lives and work. Be with those who feel this loss most deeply, comfort and guide them. And bless all of us to Caesar's memory to go with us today and always. Go in peace. <laughs>